Sweet. Thanks for coming, guys. Uh, I wanted to do a special thank you to our women's panel first, to Sarah, Emma, Laura, and Maddie, and to Kelly back there for providing the awesome food, um, for training block for sponsoring it, and to uh, Scraps for the refreshments. Um, yeah, we're super happy to have this event. I think it's a super cool topic. Um, some of you have probably been hearing a lot lot about it but I think it's gonna be really cool to hear from those that are that are in it um, so yeah I'm Chris uh, this is my gym um, I work with Sarah Laura and I pick Maddie's brain a lot because she's smart um, and I'm and... Just around. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so welcome to my gym and I'll pass it along to Sarah a little intro oh yeah. okay Okay, hello. I am I am Sarah Vaughn. Um, I've been working with Chris uh, for like a year, and um, yeah, I'm I'm glad to be here and share my experiences with you. Uh, as I have a little bit of a unique perspective um, in that I've I've had children and had come back to the marathon in a little bit of an unorthodox way. So um, yeah, I'm happy to to share. I'm Emma Bates. I'm a certified marathoner now. Um, <laughs> I've done, okay, I don't know how many now, six maybe. Um, but I started running when I was 12 years old, seventh grade. So I've been running for a very long time. So um, I know that there's a lot of ups and downs, um, especially in collegiate running and then, you know, kind of transitioning from high school to college, college professional running. So there's a lot of um, insight that I've gained over the years just through experience. So hopefully I can share some of that with you guys. Um, hello, my name is Laura Thweet, and I am also, I guess, a certified marathoner. Um, <laughs> I've been working with Chris for the last four years now. Um, and it's been just a game changer for me in my career. Um, as Emma said, I've been in the sport for a long time. I started running when I was in high school. I kind of found my way into cross country after trying almost every other sport. Um, and then, you know, haven't looked back since. So it's been quite a ride and quite a journey. Um, lots of ups and downs. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really excited to be part of this. This is something that Chris, Maddie, and I kind of envisioned a couple years ago and just wanted to kind of share uh, and talk about some of these things that we feel like, you know, we've all learned in different ways through our time and journey in the sport. And um, if we could go back and kind of give advice to our younger selves, like what would it be? And um, so, yeah, I'm really excited to be part of this tonight. All right. My name is Maddie. Um, I'm a registered dietitian. I'm also a runner. I train with Team Boss here in Boulder. Um, I own the sports nutrition business Fueling Forward. So that's part of why I'm here is the nutrition piece. There's a lot to it that a lot of female athletes don't realize. We could be doing more with nutrition to kind of help at different points throughout the cycle. Um, also, as a runner, that I've been a runner since high school now for, I guess it's been just over 10 years. I started a little later than some people, but it still feels like a long time. Um, so some of my journey throughout the sport, kind of learning some things the hard way and finding my way to, you know, a healthy approach to running and life outside of running. Um, and then also as a registered dietitian, what I can provide to you guys for answers there. So I'm really excited to be here tonight. This is fun. Sweet. Yeah. Before we dive into anything, I just wanted to say, yes, I am sitting up here. Um, kind of as, as a moderator. Uh, obviously, <laughs> I am not a woman. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's really important as a male coach because there are many, many male coaches. About 90% of coaches are men, right? So it's really important for coaches like myself to also be a student, right? So I'm sitting up here. Yeah, I am going to ask some questions and help facilitate some conversation. But I'm here as much of a, as a student as anyone else. Um, yeah, so with that being said, um, I think it's really cool to, like we all talked about, have some experience behind some of this new science and this new narrative that's coming along. Um, and I just wanted to ask, you know, firsthand and hear firsthand from these women some experiences from the past, right? You know, we they've been running for a long time, right? And what has changed from when you guys started running 
right, to what you're seeing and doing now differently that you've been like, wow, this has been a complete game changer for me, right? So if anyone wants to take that one first, I think it's just, you know, some fun life experiences. Um, I've had some interesting experiences when it comes to nutrition and coaches that I've had in the past. So I just want to share with you some like not so great experiences, I guess. Um, so when I became a professional runner, um, I just wanted to be the best that I could be. So I wanted to listen to my coach and try to figure out like what I needed to do to fuel myself in an effective way to get me to run faster. And I've never thought about food as being something that I need to change in order to get faster until I started professional running. Um, so I like turned to my coach and, you know, he was very adamant about, you know, trying fuel yourself in a way that um, your body starts to like burn fat. And so I ended up, he ended up encouraging me to do the keto diet. And if you guys don't know what that is, it's like a very high fat, high protein kind of thing. And so I, I went through this process weeks and I didn't eat any carbs and um, I started running faster initially. And so I thought this was the key to success. So I started doing that. Well, it turns out I started to lose my period. Um, for four months, I lost my period. And I went to my coach and was like, hey, like something's wrong. I don't, I've never lost my period before. This is something that I just don't think is right. Well, he didn't think that your period mattered at all. So after I heard that, I was like, I don't think that I can take advice from this person. So I ended up um, going to an actual nutritionist and sat down with the nutritionist and started talking to them about what I need to do. And they were appalled that my coach would encourage me to do this keto diet. He was like, you are running so many miles. You're burning so many calories. This is the last thing a distance athlete needs to be doing. And so I just want to share that with you guys so that you know, like, there are people that are close to you that you think are trying to help you and benefit, like, your running or your career, um, and they think that it's what's in your best interest, but you have to kind of do your own research um, sometimes or go to people that are actually certified, like certified dietitians, um, who actually know how to properly fuel yourself. So I was running pretty terribly after, you know, losing my period for four months and I, it took me a very long time to get back to a baseline of running really well again and feeling really good again. Um, but I'm glad I went through that experience so that I know like what my body needs and that is carbs. Our bodies love carbs. So that's just one of the experiences that I've had. So I don't know if you guys have an experience that you've gone through that's kind of been not so great. Um, <clears throat> mine's a little bit different. I didn't have like one like point, but I think in high school, uh, I felt like I was pretty lucky. I, you know, my parents didn't really know too much about the sport. They were just happy that I'd found something that I really enjoyed to do. Um, so I just kind of fell into it. And, you know, my high school coach was previously a football coach and, you know, there just wasn't a lot of like pressure or expectation. And, you know, I grew up back in the day where we didn't have social media and it wasn't as easy to kind of look around and think you should be doing something a certain way or think that you should look a certain way. Um, the struggle for me, I think, was when I advance to the next level. Um, and I went on to run collegiately. Um, I had a great experience. I learned a lot. Um, but that's when I really started to kind of struggle with comparing myself and kind of got it in my head that to be a really great runner, uh, I needed to look a certain way. Um, at that point, I was starting to kind of follow the sport more. I was starting to, you know, look at these incredible female athletes, many of whom were professionals or many of whom were like very late into their collegiate career and were just at a different developmental stage than I was. Um, but I was looking at their body types and, you know, kind of looking at like their six packs and, you know, I got it in my head, like I have to look like that. Like that's what a runner should look like. And I remember once, I think it was like my senior year in high school, um, like, you know, I was just like a tinier kid growing up. Um, but people would always kind of throw that comment like, oh, like you look like a runner, like you have like the light runner's body, you know, and like you don't really think about that. Like I didn't initially, but then as I kind of got into college and I started to kind of like look around the sport and I started to kind of focus on just those very just 
like those certain aspects um, and kind of got tunnel vision on like what I suddenly thought I had to do or look like. Um, and so, you know, you're like, I was like terrified of like gaining weight and like, it was hard too, because I thought I was, you're still developing in college, like, especially like your freshman and sophomore year, Addie, I'm sure can speak to that more, but you know, you're still growing, you're still developing, your body is still changing different things. And, you know, I didn't really know that I was trying to keep my body as like my high school body. So, you know, I slowly got it in my head that I needed to like restrict and I needed to do like portion control and I need to like measure out like pasta and like how many like crackers I was eating. And just like, I went like really extreme again, trying to like maintain this really like light, like 90 pound frame, which just like isn't healthy and it's not feasible, uh, especially again, when you're trying to run all these miles in college, you know, you have all these other outside stresses with school and social life and living independently. And, you know, like you're going through all of that and then you're just not feeling yourself. Um, and so I started to get injured. Um, I spent the first collegiate career pretty injured. Um, it was just one injury after the other. Um, cause again, I would kind of get healthy and then I would, you know, go right back to just, you know, restricting food and just trying to like get as lean as I possibly could. And, you know, when you're injured and you're taking time off again, your body's changing. And, you know, I just didn't know how to like ride those waves appropriately. Um, and I didn't really have a support system of people telling me that what I was doing was not healthy. Um, it was almost a little bit of an environment. Um, I was, you know, living with other girls that were doing the same thing. So again, I was just like, this is what it takes to be good at this level. Um, and I thought I was taking it seriously. And I thought that I was like, you know, being dedicated and I was doing again, all the things that I assumed it took to have the success that I wanted to have. Um, and so, you know, and then I started missing periods. Um, and again, I thought that was a good thing. I was like, oh, that must mean that like, I'm like lean, you know, cause you'd hear people talk about like how, if you're missing periods, like your body fat's low and I'm like, oh, well, that's a good thing. So again, like I just got really caught up early in my collegiate career and kind of the negative messaging and kind of that old school messaging that light is fast. Um, and it's not because I kept getting injured and I was really unhealthy. Um, and so finally at the end of my sophomore year, um, we had an amazing, uh, female trainer and she finally sat me down and was like, what are you doing? Like, you can't keep going this route. If you keep going this route, like your career is going to be over before it even really starts. Um, so that was kind of my struggle was in college and trying to figure all of that out. Um, so if I could give any advice from kind of that brief overview of that time um, would just to be like, there is no one way to look. There is no one body type. There is, you know, like healthy is fast, strong is fast. Like, you know, like fueling is so important. Like the, like what you give your body, like just all those message, like those messages that it took me almost into my professional career, a couple years into my pro career to really start to figure out. I wish that I had someone helping kind of guide me um, and pulling me aside earlier and being like, this isn't the route. Like, this isn't how you have to look. This isn't what you have to do, you know? Um, so that's kind of my brief, not so great time trying to figure that out when I was a really young athlete and just didn't have resources or anyone to kind of point me in a different direction. Yeah. So I think Laura's experience sums up a lot of the people that I work with, a lot of the female athletes that I work with have very similar experiences. I was very fortunate, a similar situation. My parents didn't know anything about running really, and neither did I. And so I just did whatever I wanted with fueling. And I had a really healthy relationship with food growing up. But as I became a dietitian, I realized that was unfortunately a very rare experience in the sport of distance running. Um, it's rare to meet people that have a healthy relationship with food and haven't ever tried cutting everything out, including gluten, dairy, all these things who stopped eating dessert. Um, you know, I, I didn't realize how much of an issue it was until I really got into the field and realized over half of my female clients have some form of disordered eating, some of them as far as an eating disorder. Um, and it's so prevalent because of this comparison piece that Laura was talking about. There's so much misinformation out there with when it comes to nutrition there's unfortunately a lot of people in positions of power giving athletes horrible, harmful advice. And my biggest piece of advice to anyone who works with female athletes, um, be really careful what you say. If you are not qualified in nutrition, um, don't 
give advice. Uh, it's better just not to say it if you're not sure, because it's really surprising how long things will stick with athletes. Um, I had a coach one time, I mean, oh my gosh, like 10 years ago, almost say something like you should have 500 calories at each meal. I'm a registered dietitian. I went to school for eight years and I will sometimes catch myself being like, Oh, that's over 500 calories. And I'm like, what are you doing? That's not even relevant. That's just an arbitrary number that they came up with. So Definitely do not give nutrition advice. If you feel like you have an athlete who is struggling or needs help, please refer to a professional. There are physicians who are out there to help catch athletes who are underfueling. Unfortunately, you do get the physicians who say it's it's normal for female athletes to lose their period because they're training hard. Um, if that's the case, find a different physician. We've got some great physicians. There's one here tonight who's awesome and works with athletes. Um, so finding somebody who can really support you as an athlete is very important. And then finding somebody who's qualified to give nutrition advice. So this is my little dietitian soapbox, but um, how many people know the difference between dietitian and nutritionist? Or did you know there was a difference? Yeah, some people do. Um, but the biggest difference, dietitian, is we're licensed. So we have to have at least a master's degree now and do 1,200 hours of practice under other dietitians pass a licensure exam, maintain license every five years. Um, so if I give harmful advice, I lose my license and I lose my career. And a nutritionist, while there are qualified nutritionists out there, um, it's a very broad term and you can become a certified nutritionist from paying for a program online or just very random things that there's no like set path, there's no standard of care, um, there's no research-based premises behind the curriculum. Um, and really anyone can pass the exam if they take it over and over, right? So I think, like I said, there are qualified nutritionists out there, but it's really important to find somebody. Dietitians are all qualified. So if you have nutrition questions, don't look on TikTok, don't look on blogs, um, don't just ask your teammate what they're doing, you know, find somebody who knows what they're doing. Because like Laura said, there's a lot of people who really don't know. And then young athletes look at them and say, oh, that must be how it's done. And then they start to do that. And it kind of gets you into a vicious cycle. So that's what I've seen as a practitioner with athletes um, in my experience so far. And I, I see something new every day. But yeah, it's, it's a very common experience, what both Emma and Laura shared earlier. <laughs> Amazing points brought up there, um, and some I didn't want to just glance over. Um, so we mentioned amenorrhea, losing your period. Um, that's never okay, right? Um, and with that, um, hand in hand goes red S. Um, so I wanted to, I know Maddie just spoke, but I wanted to hand this back to the expert in the room and you know can you tell us a little bit more about amenorrhea and the three different types um and then also red s and what that means um and how you can recognize some symptoms right Yes. So red S, I'm very happy to hear it's becoming a more popular term. Um, it stands for relative energy deficiency in sport. And so the best way I explain it, it, think of like a scale. On one side, we have energy out. So all the energy you're using to support training and just daily life. And then on the other side, we have energy in. So this is fueling nutrition. Um, and if they're out of balance, so if we're either overtraining or under fueling or both, that is when we start to see this relative energy deficiency come up. And it used to be called the female athlete triad. So my, some of you might be more familiar with that term. Um, it used to be like a triangle where it was like, you aren't eating enough, you lose your period. Um, and we now know it's a lot more complicated than that. And it also affects male athletes too. So that's an important point that I want to mention as well. Um, with female athletes, you know, losing your period can definitely be part of it, but you don't have to lose your period to actually have red S. Um, so that is an important point. A lot of athletes will be like, oh, I still have my period, so I'm good. And that's not really the case a lot of the times. There's tons of different symptoms. Um, so some easy, like quick ones that I would say I see a lot in athletes, trouble sleeping or new trouble sleeping is a big one, changes in mood, becoming more irritable, things like that, um, noticing more GI issues. So that can be counterintuitive because a lot of athletes will try to eat less or eat differently to help, but that actually makes it worse. Um, micronutrient deficiencies, so like low iron, vitamin D, those kinds of things, those don't just happen out of nowhere because you're training hard. Those are happening because we're not getting the nutrients that we need to support 
red blood cell health and things like that. Um, another big one I would say is just chronic fatigue, soreness. So if you're sore for multiple days at a time, despite doing the same training, that's definitely a red flag. And then of course, losing your period is, is usually one of the more severe symptoms. Um, bone mineral density is always affected. So if we're not eating enough, we're going to start losing bone density. And over the course of time, we're going to increase risk for stress fractures and bone related injuries. Um, and actually lose bone density. So I've had a few athletes who are recovering from red S who are in their 20s who have osteoporosis. Um, so that's a disease that you would associate with elderly women. Um, but it's not just elderly people that can get it. It's athletes who don't fuel well. So we really peak our bone density in our 20s. And if we're, you know, focused on having a great race in our 20s at the expense of our body, that's what really sets you up for long-term health implications. So, you know, it's about more than just that one season. It's also about that long-term health. And something I hear from all my athletes who have red S or are recovering from it, they wish they knew earlier that it was a thing. And they wish they knew how big of an impact it really would have on their life and how hard the recovery process is um, because your body kind of goes from one end to the other until it finds its balance again. So a lot of athletes who are recovering will experience a lot of big rebounds in weight and slowing down, and that can be really triggering and send them back into old behaviors um, because it's a stressful situation. So many athletes who have been through it or are going through it always tell me they wish they knew that was a thing before it happened. Um, so they could prioritize it ahead of time. And, you know, that's what's really going to help you have a long career in sport, not just losing weight and initially becoming faster, but then having all these long-term impacts um, and not really reaching your full potential. So that's kind of in a nutshell what Red S is. Um, for female athletes, in terms of losing your period, there can be several different causes for it. Um, one concern for younger female athletes, if you haven't gotten it by age 15, that can be a sign that there are some issues with energy balance. Um, if you're losing your period, so it's going you know, more than a month without one, that's considered a missed period. Um, so if you're missing, you know, if you're not getting 11 to 12 periods per year, that's considered irregular periods. And if you're not getting them all together for three consecutive mo months, that's considered amenorrhea. Um, and that's definitely a big red flag that something is going on. So that's how I would explain that in a nutshell. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, I wanted to add one thing I've heard. Um, you know, people ask me sometimes, oh, well, can I just increase my bone density or, you know, increase my strength by just doing strength work, right? And the short answer is yes, but ultimately no, right? If you are still not getting that energy you need to build, you can't build. You can't build bone density. You can't build strength. You can't build muscle, right? So if you think about what you're doing in the weight room, you know, you are breaking tissue. You are causing micro trauma in the body. And if you don't have the resources to repair, right, you got to go and figure that part out first, right? This is not a, it's not a shortcut, right? All the things have to be working together. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> I feel like there was a lot of negative stuff there, right? Which is, you know, it, should, it, it shouldn't have to be, right? And um, some of the positives I want to talk about is, and this is a question for myself, right? What are some great ways that coaches, men or women, can approach a topic and say, hey, you know, Laura, how are you doing? What's going on? You know, like, I don't really know what's going on with you, but you do. So yeah, let's chat a little bit. Um, if anyone wants to um, I have, well, my husband coaches me, so that makes the topic a little bit easier, um, these days, but in the past I've had all male coaches my whole career. Um, I've been lucky in that I've, I've never lost my period unless I was pregnant. Um, and so I've, I've been able to like have a pretty predictable cycle and it's been super awkward to talk about that with coaches sometimes. In fact, Chris, I think you're the first coach outside of my husband that I've actually <laughs> talked to it about. And it was the one day we were doing like single leg something. I kept falling over and you were like, I know what's going on. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah. Um, I, 
I found though that I think it would be really helpful. I have an app that I use to track and it's helpful for me, but I think that would be like a really cool tool to just share with your coach. And then you don't have to like, it doesn't have to be so awkward and so goofy. You can just say, here's my calendar. Here's where I am in my cycle. It highlights the days where your period is expected. And then they can, you can send them a screenshot and they could check in with you on those days um, and see how you're doing. I, I just think that's one really practical way. Um, that's how I would uh, ask a male coach. That's how I would do it now. Yeah. Um, I have a similar experience to Sarah. Um, so I never talked about my period. I never knew the different phases uh, of the menstrual cycle. It's just something that, you know, I eventually learned that you want to have one consistently and not having one is not a good thing. It doesn't mean that you're like fit and, you know, training really well. Um, so that's all I kind of knew is that you wanted to have a period. But beyond that, you know, and, you know, you obviously, for those of for the women in the room, you know how you feel when you're on your period or when you're about to start. But outside of that, I just had no idea really how it affected my training, if at all. Um, and I always knew that I didn't really want to be on my period during a race, but that was like about it. That was like my knowledge of all of that. Um, and so a couple years ago, I think two years ago, maybe now, um, I was in this gym with Chris and I was really struggling. I was tired. I just felt like lethargic. I just, you know, training had been difficult the last few weeks. Uh, I couldn't figure out what was going on. You know, we weren't able to really do any of the work that we were normally doing in here. Um, I just felt like I wasn't recovering. And so Chris just sat me down in that back room and he was just like, what phase of your menstrual cycle are you in? And I was like, what? Like he was just like, you know, and again, like Sarah, I've had all male coaches, um, my entire career. And it was just never something I've, it was never a conversation that I thought I could sit down and, and have with a male coach, nor really knew how or wanted to. Um, I think there's, you know, kind of this uncomfortability with talking about something that can feel kind of intimate to you. Um, and so he just sat me down and straight up was just like, what phase are you in? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And so he on the whiteboard back there, he like basically did this diagram of like all the different phases of like your menstrual cycle and how depending on what phase you're in really can affect your training, what you're able to do in training with intensity, mileage, uh, what recovery looks like, when you need to recover more, what you need to be doing fueling wise in each of the phases. And like, I'm 32 years old. I'm like 16, 17 years into my running career. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, how have I gotten this far as an athlete, as a female athlete, and now one at a professional level. And I had no idea about like the impact of my own physiology on my training. Um, and so, but any, so to answer the question, I think, you know, male coach, um, like Sarah said, I think having, you know, um, having female athletes, like letting them know about apps and different ways that they can track it that way. But Chris was just really confident. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't like shaky on it. He was just like, Hey, like, you know, where are you at in your cycle? Um, that can really, that may be affecting like what we're seeing with training or kind of what's going on with the recovery piece that you're not getting. And just like his comfortability with it and being able to just sit down and, and have that conversation, um, was really eye opening to me. So I think the more comfortable coaches can be and just again having resources and having a little bit more of that knowledge with it can aid in just making you more comfortable to sit down with female athletes if you feel like that conversation needs to be had um i think it's easier than than we think it can be which again is why we're all up here tonight yeah i think that's what has changed so much over the years is coaches have just become more aware and more comfortable in talking about it um my coach right now i'm on team boss with maddie so joe bossard is my coach and he also just like asked me where i am in my cycle all the time and it's just like such a conversation and once it becomes like consistent it you have this relationship with your coach where you can share so much more than just like when you have your period you can share so much 